We're here because we don't buy into the bullshit of mainstream culture. We're tired of the mundane, passionless careers we've been shuffled into as a result of this orchestrated, debt-based system of rule, and the stranglehold on education and entertainment by cold, soulless corporations. People, yes, we are frustrated. Yes, we are tired. And we reject the pre-approved tranquilizers that are Monday Night Football and an ice-cold Budweiser. But we have to stop hiding. Stop hiding behind the headphones and the Cherry Popper 420 username. Let the world see that the resistance is strong and society is changing. There was a time to be anonymous, but that time has passed. And so the higher side chats would like to present conspiracies as the dawning of this new paradigm in the uniform of the revolution. Because bold fashion should mean more than some celebrity meat dress or frat boy in a silly pink polo. Conspiracies redefines bold fashion as having the balls to reject socially uncomfortable and unpopular truths from your radiant chest all fucking day. Conspiracies.net. Let them know that you know. Bold designs for troubled times. Hard truths. Soft cock. Side chatters drinking a little drink smoking a little smoke from sunny san diego i'm greg carlwood and today is such a great show we got john perkins in the house identifying some of the problems and offering up some incremental solutions to try to turn this ship around and being another fifth episode we complete one magical money bomb cycle and another begins this round got pretty damn high and i split the listeners half between two lucky listeners and each got 421 dollars how appropriate a number can you get and that was a legitimate split. So we're going to talk to one of the Money Bomb winners today for just three or four minutes before the interview. And then we'll talk to the other one next week. So let's get this party started. Here's my conversation with Eric. And we'll be rocking like a hurricane on the other side with John Perkins. All right, people. I'm here with my man, Eric, one of the two Money Bomb winners that we have this week. Eric, man, thanks for donating. Congrats. How you doing? Pretty good, man. Just hanging out. Just uh, pretty excited when I got your email that I'd won. So pretty random, cool surprise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, thanks a lot for putting in. It's it's a big deal. You know, people can listen to the show for free. So when they take the time to actually donate some hard-earned money, I mean, that means a lot. It says a lot. So I, I greatly appreciate it. Right on, man. Well, uh, it's a good show. Thanks, man. And I wanted to ask you, so... You know, I asked you what you do, but you uh, you kind of told me, you know, outside of your job, you got some uh, bigger aspirations, huh? Yeah, definitely, man. Um, yeah, you know, I've just been into the whole, uh, like, I guess, alternative knowledge thing for a while since I was a kid. And, you know, just uh, been trying to find my own voice in the, in the community and just, you know, listening to shows like yours, like just hearing your progression, like how you've been able to take the show and do what you've been looking for, like things like that have been like inspiring me to kind of pursue that in more of a uh you know in a, in a more motivated manner i would say to get those yeah. to get my ideas out there so it's just uh just like uh actually like winning this is kind of like whoa all right maybe uh maybe i am on the right steps here <laughs> yeah man <laughs> the universe is speaking to you so when i do these things i always like to ask people if they have a favorite guest or topic or thread of research that we dive into that really grabs you that you uh, would like to see explored more yeah, uh, definitely, man. Um, you know, I, I'm really into the whole uh, aspects of consciousness and the whole like uh, control mechanisms like involved with our consciousness. Because like at the end of the day, that's the root of everything as, as far as my ideas on, you know, these things. And yeah, just uh, so like in, in that vein, like guys like Tessarian, like I love that you've had Tessarian on like, uh, you know, just watching him, like his research is just jam packed, just like back to back things are just such <laughs> such knowledge and just like it, it, it's really cool to uh to hear guys like this area and on the show right on man yeah he was one of my favorite guests i'd love to get him again but apparently he's not doing interviews at the moment um he's been at oh, the wow. game for a long time so i understand wanting to take a break but are there any other guys like to or guys talking about consciousness that i haven't had on the show yet that you'd love to see 
I mean, you know, there's always those guys that are the, a lot of the, uh, you know, you talked about a little bit about the psychedelic and entogenic experience, like anybody like in those realms, like, I mean, I know like guys like Pinchbeck are like huge right now. So <laughs> like that, that's like a big, you know, big draw, but anybody, anybody speaking about those kinds of subjects would be awesome to hear from and just the relationship that has. Pinchbeck's a tall order, but I mean, I'll see what I can do. I think Dan Fogler might know him from uh, the Don Peyote movie. He was he was involved with that. He's kind of like a he's kind of like a pseudo celebrity psychedelic guru, um, kind of in a strange position. So I don't know. He might yeah. be tough to reach, but I feel uh, you on that. I, I I'll uh, you know challenge accepted, as Barney Stinson would say. <laughs> but um, you know another <laughs> right. thing I always like to ask money bomb winners is do you have any plans for the money you know it's made up of of the listeners donations you know a lot of people chipping in five ten dollars at a time it builds up you've now got 421 dollars um i think the people usually like to get a good idea of what someone might do with their donations yeah definitely man um you know i had like no plans for the money since it's so random but i definitely <laughs> want to do some good stuff with it so uh i was definitely going to put some back into the show oh um, nice yeah, definitely. I want to snag some of uh, some of your conspiracies. I got the uh, aliens and pyramid shirt, the pyramid builders. Oh, cool. So, uh, yeah, I definitely want to grab a few more of those. Well, thanks. And uh, yeah, man, for sure. And then uh, if anything's left, I want to try to uh, get some more of my photography out there. I do photography, and I've been needing to get some prints done, like some good frame prints. So right hopefully I'll uh, put some stuff out. Yeah, man, you should – Make that a priority. You know, I got my half. You know, I'm doing I'm doing okay. I mean, the show might go through some changes sometime soon, but, um, you know, I'll maintain. But, you know, you got this gift from the universe. I don't think it was just to give it all back. I think you should get yourself whatever you need for photography and pursue that, man. Because if you don't, you're going to be stuck doing what you do for money that's probably not your passion. And you're going to be just watching time fly by, thinking about when you're going to have the money to go get the supplies you need to really get your art going. Right on, man. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, you got it. So, dude, thanks for listening to the show. Much appreciated for donating. Uh, you seem like a good guy. I'm glad you could win. And, yeah, man, take care of yourself out there. Any other last words for the people? Nah, just uh, keep listening to The Higher Side. It's a great show. You got tons of subjects all over the place. I love it. You know, it never gets boring. So, uh Pretty cool, man. Appreciate right. everything. Thank you, man. Take care of yourself. All right, man. You too. Folks, we all see the string pullers in the world marching millions of us little marionettes right off the economic cliff, but they've got us so burdened by trying to stay afloat in our individual lives that we just can't seem to make any progress on the bigger picture, despite how obvious the problems might be. We've allowed psychopathic, bloodthirsty corporations to maximize their private profits at the expense of entire nations of people and ultimately the planet itself. While everyone can agree this is a recipe for disaster, most of us know very little about the inner workings of the system and better yet, how to fix it. Well, they say if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, and today's guest has been on both sides of that fence. John Perkins is best known for his best-selling book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, where he describes his role as the chief economist for a major international consulting firm in the 1970s. He advised the World Bank, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and a multitude of Fortune 500 companies and countries in the role where he was instructed to undermine entire populations for the benefit of private corporations using large, unpayable loans, government policy, and debt as the primary weapons. Lucky for us, John has done a 180 and today is one of the most well-known whistleblowers on the subject. In his latest book, Hoodwinked, he describes how these systems of economic control have evolved and also lays out a plan to change course and fix a lot of the problems before it's too late. I know I'm psyched to have him here. John, my man, welcome to THC. It's great to be with you today, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, man. It's a serious honor to talk with you, and I commend you for exposing the world of economic hitman in these programs rather than just burying your morals down deep and retiring to an island somewhere, which I'm sure it would have been easy to do. Well, actually, I live on an island just off the coast, <laughs> coast of Seattle, Bainbridge Island, but I'm not retired, that's for sure, traveling around a lot, speaking on these things. And, you know, it's a, it's a this is the most amazing time to be alive. We're, we're, we're truly going through a the biggest revolution in history, I think, bigger than the agricultural or industrial revolutions. This is a revolution in consciousness. And across the planet, we're really experiencing people rising to a new level of consciousness, but we've got to push it further and take actions accordingly. I agree with you there. I'm, I'm very hopeful for the way people seem to be waking up to a lot of these problems. And 
Uh, to get us started, I'm sure most of the audience is going to be familiar with your first book and your lengthy appearance in Zeitgeist Addendum, which I loved. But um, let me just have you give a little more detail on the role of an economic hitman for people who might not be familiar yet. Well, I think it's fair to say that we economic hitmen have created the world's first truly global empire. It's not a national empire. It's not an American empire, really. It's, it's, it's a corporate empire, and many of those corporations are based in the United States and certainly use our facilities, the Pentagon, all of our intelligence agencies, to serve their best interests, what they consider to be their best interests. But the, we really have a global corporate empire led by people that I call the corporatocracy, people who head up our biggest corporations. Um, and incidentally, a lot of them don't even know each other. It's not really a conspiracy. We can, we can get into that more later. <laughs> but it is this huge empire. And it was really created by economic hitmen, not by any military. Uh, and the way that we work, well, economic hitmen work many ways, but the most generic is that we'll identify a country that has resources those corporations covet, like oil, arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sisters, but the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country, things like power plants and industrial parks and highways that serve a few very wealthy families in those countries, the ones who own the industry and the big businesses. And, of course, the primary beneficiary are our own corporations that build the projects. But <laughs> these infrastructure projects do serve the wealthy families but not the majority of the people who are too poor to buy much electricity, don't have cars to drive on highways, can't get jobs in industrial parks because they don't hire many people, and yet they're left holding a huge debt that they can't repay. The country can't repay its debt. So at yeah. some point we go back and say, you know, sell your resource, your oil, whatever it is, real cheap to our corporations without any environmental restrictions or social regulations. Uh, let us build a military base on your soil, privatize your electric utilities, your water and sewage systems, sell them or give them to our corporations. And in the few cases where we, succeed, where we fail, Greg, the, what I call the jackals go in, and mm -hmm. these are people that will either assassinate the leaders that haven't bought into this deal or uh, throw them out in coups. And in the few cases where the jackals fail, such as with Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi, and then we send in the military. So the military is always there in the background. But essentially, this is the first empire in history that's truly global, A, and B, hasn't been created by the military for the most part. It's been created by economic hitmen through debt, essentially. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating story. And it was shocking to hear those steps, you know, when I, when I read your, both of your books at this point. But uh, can you give the people, like, one clear anecdote from your experiences on, uh, like, where, where is this happening? Where have we done this in the past? Well, my goodness, Every, you name a country that's got <laughs> resources that our corporations want, and that includes labor, as a, cheap labor as a resource, and, 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 and that country has been hit. And, you know, in, in my book, I, well, I, two, two countries that really stand out are, are Ecuador and, and Panama, where I failed. I, I was not able to bring the, the presidents, democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and the president of uh, Panama, Omar Torrijos, I wasn't able to bring them around. I wasn't able, they had tremendous integrity. And, and, and right. I failed with them. And so the jackals went in and both, men, both, both of these men were assassinated. I had great success in countries like Indonesia and Iran and Saudi Arabia, Colombia, Guatemala, Argentina. So, and I describe all of those countries in, in, in the books, but but, you know, I think for me, the most outstanding were the two where I failed because then I saw what, what, what really happens. When I was going through all of this, incidentally, nothing I do or economic hitmen do is illegal. It's all perfectly legal. And it, it shouldn't be, but it is. But, and and mm -hmm. it's approved by the World Bank. It's taught in business schools. This is the way to help countries develop, give them these huge loans, put them into deep debt. You know, it's a little bit like what we tell our students, mm -hmm. you know, go into deep debt, get a degree, get a master's degree and spend the rest of your life trying to bail out from under the debt and basically being a slave to corporations or the banks. Um, but right. it's done on a national and basis this way. And it's, it's totally legal. 
Um, and, and, and for me, the, the countries where I failed were the ones who really taught me how, how terribly subversive the system is. Yeah, I can understand that because you see the deeper levels of how they're going to get their way because they're determined to get their way. I mean, one thing I took away from Hoodwink that really stuck with me was the Latin American situations in Honduras and Guatemala and some of those other Latin American countries where they elect leaders who want to raise the minimum wage and bring their people out of poverty. But these large companies like Dole and Chiquita just pay to overthrow new leaders who try to do that. It literally is like holding a gun to the heads of an entire nation and using them as slave labor. And if you buy their products, you're kind of contributing to that madness. But what can you do? You know, who knew the banana business was so serious? Exactly. And, and in fact, that just uh, happened uh, just a couple of years ago in Honduras, where the democratically elected president, uh, President Zelaya, went up against Chiquita and Dole. He tried to have a major land reform that would that they saw might have hurt them, also to increase the minimum wage, which is extremely low, uh, by 60%. And Dole, Chiquita, Russell Athletic, and several other big corporations were strongly uh, opposed to this. Economic hitmen went in and tried to bribe Zelaya out of his policies. He didn't work. He wouldn't give in. And so he was deposed. He was overthrown in a... A pretty nasty coup. Yeah, just a couple of years ago. It, it's the same old pattern. I mean, you know, you've been active in this since the '70s, and it's still going on in 2009. You know, uh, have you seen any type of evolution occur, or have they fine-tuned their their methods, or is the same kind of thing still working? Well, what we saw in in Honduras was classic. It was almost almost a, the mirror image of what had happened in the early 50s in, in Guatemala with President Arbenz, and that was also Dole and Chiquita. The, the United, Chiquita was called United Fruit in those days, but same basic companies, same technique, and we saw it in Iran with, with Mossadegh and many other places. So the classic still goes on, but, but there's a whole new process too now. In addition to economic hitmen like me, who I would basically classify as generic, we were out to promote big corporations, and we often didn't really care which big corporations get the contracts, whether it was Bechtel or Brown and Root or who, as long as it was a big corporation that would end up essentially taking over the country and putting it in deep debt and getting its resources available to our other corporations. Today, in addition to people like me in those days who still exist, there also every major corporation has its version of economic hitman. <laughs> So Exxon has economic hitmen, Texaco has economic hitmen, Monsanto does, and Walmart does, that are promoting the specific interests of those companies. And I think another major difference is that today, in many cases, you don't have to assassinate or overthrow a president. Um, assassination by reputation, character assassination, has become a big issue. Mm -hmm. So... You know, we saw Bill Clinton's political career destroyed not by a bullet, but by character assassination through Monica Lewinsky. Uh, we saw the head of the IMF, Strauss-Kahn, brought down by a sex scandal. He probably would have been the next president of France and was threatening to do some things that many other countries didn't like regarding the European Union and the Central European Bank. He probably would have instituted policies that, that, our, that big corporations were very opposed to. So he was destroyed in a sex scandal. Now, I think he was a sex addict. Um, but the, the, the point is, they know this. You know, the right. NSA knows, knows this. And so you go for the weak point. So today we've also, the jackals have taken on a new role. It's assassinations through cybernetics, through getting information about people and then bringing them down uh, through sex or drug scandals or something similar. Yeah, the the character assassination threat is pretty interesting because just recently, you know, the the Bilderbergs they meet all the time. A lot of these corporate leaders are involved in in those meetings, and uh, I had Daniel Estelin on who has been looking into those meetings for a long time, and he was under the impression that he thought Obama would be in hot water for not getting a lot of the policies through in the past couple of years. And then right after, we see in the mainstream media this big POW exchange uh, between Guantanamo prisoners and the one U.S. soldier, the one lone POW. And now all the media stations are saying that this might be an impeachable offense. He might have broken the law. He might be spending time in jail. And the media is 
the ones who direct the narrative. So it is kind of interesting to see that play out even even here. It seems like he's getting put on the hook for something when it might really have to do with something else. Yeah. Well, people have been very tough on Obama and in a way rightfully so that he has not followed through on many of his you know, promised uh, campaigns. He's, you know, had more drones than right. Bush ever had and so on and so forth. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is he, he doesn't have much power. No, no president does. Our senators don't have much power. They're all extremely vulnerable to character assassination. Yeah. Let's th- face it, you know, everybody's got a, a skeleton in their closet. And, and even if you didn't, the FBI can qu- easily find one, you know, or, <laughs> you know and, and get it out there to the press, like, like, like what you're talking about, this impeachable act idea that's – you know, and, and when Strauss Khan is brought down or something like that happens anywhere, it, it sends a note notice to all of these people. Um, and, and so we, we have to look at a situation today where our, our political leaders are not powerful at all. They're beholden to big corporations. You can't get elected to a major position. You certainly can't be elected president of the United States without selling your soul to the big corporations right. and getting them enough money. It's not Obama's fault. He wouldn't be president if that didn't happen. But we, the people, have to recognize that we cannot turn to our elected officials to straighten things out because they don't have the power to do it. Only we have that power. And the big corporations have the power. And we ultimately have a lot of power over big corporations. Yeah, it, I mean, that is an important thing to remember. It, it's kind of a scary realization to think that they have no power. But, uh, yeah, we're going to have to do something else. And these types of predatory behaviors, they seem to extend to all types of corporations and industries. I mean, energy, resources, shoes, cell phones. Is it fairly safe to say that most companies at the top of their field are at least complacent with these policies? I mean, you said a lot of them have employees that are their own economic hitmen. I mean, it seems like that's necessary to be at the top of one's field in today's game. Well, yes. Um, I I think, you know, we can really um, trace a lot of the problems back to about the time when I was an economic hitman in the 70s. When I went to business school in the late 60s, I was taught that a good CEO makes a decent rate of return on investments. That's the only way you get investors. But a good CEO has many other responsibilities and goals to, to take good care of his employees, to provide good health care, insurance, and pensions, and uh, take good care of his suppliers and his customers, and also be a good community citizen. Not just pay taxes, but also uh, support schools and recreation centers and and so forth. But in the in the 70s, all that changed when Milton Friedman at the Chicago School of Economics won the Nobel Prize in economics by saying essentially the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits. And Reagan bought into it. Thatcher bought into it. A lot of world leaders bought into it. And every major U.S. president since, Democrat and Republican alike, has bought into that idea. It's a terrible idea. But if you, if you, if you buy into that, if you believe that the only job of your corporation is to make profits, then you, that you have an excuse to do anything you need to do to make that happen as long as you stay within the law or uh, essentially bribe public officials to change the law as to help you make more and more profits. So these big corporations are really the ones that write the laws. You know, I think during some of my lifetime, quite a lot of it, in fact, the elected officials in the United States wrote the laws, but they don't anymore. Uh, corporate lobbyists write the laws, at least the major laws, <laughs> and they run them through elected officials who they now own. So we elect these people, but they don't represent us once they're elected. They represent the big corporations for the most part. There are some exceptions, but for the most part. Yeah, it's almost like a proxy government. It's just they're just placeholders. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it, it, is a prox- it, it is a proxy government. And, and it, really what we're describing here, I, I, I hate to overuse this word, but it's, a, it's a really a, a pretty much of a fascist state where uh, if you define fascism as, as a lot of people do as being where, where uh, business and, and government corroborate mm-hmm. and, 
that's certainly happening in, in the United States today, which I'm, I'm very sad to, to say. Absolutely. I agree with you. And a lot of heartless Westerners might say, yeah, I mean, it sucks, but I get the benefit of cheap sneakers and cheap bananas and never really see any downside. But it only makes sense that when you dominate small targets in the third world, eventually, you'd, and, it's, and it's working so well, you'd eventually go after bigger ones. And these practices are no longer just confined to the third world as they once were, right? Absolutely. And that's, you know, it's a lot of what I write about in Hoodwink is how uh, what what goes around comes around. And, and so what worked in, in these other countries when I was in economic hip, now we're now using against our, you know, everybody, the corporations are using it against the middle class and the lower classes, encouraging people to take on huge amounts of debt that they can't afford to take on, uh, you know, telling and, and, and this is part of what what the recession that we went through or depression was about was. Our, the bankers who, who most of us grew up just trusting the banker. Heck, you know, we, we were taught the banker's never going to take, <laughs> never going to let you take a loan that you, that, that you can't pay back. Yeah. But in fact, you know, what happened was bankers told people that could only afford a $300,000 house to go out and buy a $500,000 house and tighten their belt. And within five years, it was going to be worth a million dollars and they would be a millionaire and you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, that was, was a huge con. And, and of course, now the, a major con is telling kids, hey, take these huge loans, go to these really expensive colleges, and when, and when you get out, uh, you'll get a much better job. And, of mm-hmm. course, the, the sidebar to that is you'll have sold your soul to corporations. Yes, you may get a good job, but it'll be working for a big corporation that'll basically steal your soul. And, you know, I can't tell you how many as I lecture at colleges and meet with college students, how many of them tell me, hey, you know, I went to law school because I wanted to be an environmental attorney and defend the environment. But now that I've got all this debt, I can't do that. I got to go to work for a big oil company or an mm-hmm. agribusiness company. I hear this over and over from Law students and and MBA students and and all kind of students at all levels of, of education. Yeah, so. I mean it's it's just rinse and repeat. You know, you get someone in debt and you control them, whether it's uh, for schooling or for housing or an entire nation for trying to raise their minimum wage. Like you just you force them into debt and you make any decision for them. It's it seems so simple, but yet so many people just aren't aware that this is how the world is run. And the big global meltdown that occurred in 2008, we hear a lot about those countries, again, that were burdened with enormous debts. And countries like Iceland seem to have made better decisions than the rest of us, didn't they? Well, Iceland's a great example of, yeah, a country that did make the right decision. And there are a number of others, Ecuador, Brazil, Argentina, all of them have refused to pay off their debts. I was in Iceland several years ago. So Iceland went from being the third wealthiest country in the world on a per capita basis uh, to going into deep bankruptcy in about 2007. And and I I, I, I went there, I went mm-hmm. traveled around, I was invited to travel around, give speeches at universities and various other rallies and so on, encouraging the country not to pay its debts, to refuse to pay them, to say, hey, we don't owe these. Corrupt bankers took on these debts. We, the people, never agreed to all of this. And something similar happened in Ecuador where President Rafael Correa, who has a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois, had said, I'm not going to pay off a lot of this world bank debt because it was accepted by dictators here in this country. The people never agreed to it. The dictators get rich, their families get rich, but the people suffered, so I'm not paying it. And in, in both cases, uh, these countries refused to pay. So Iceland finally voted in a re- huge in a referendum. A huge majority of the countries, over ninety percent, voted in favor of not paying off their debts. And now Iceland is considered one of the great financial successes of the European zone, which it's considered to be in. And uh, it, you know, it, 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 it's it's pulling through. And in both cases, Iceland and Ecuador are now saying, well, maybe we'll pay 20 cents on the dollar or something of the debt. We'll pay <laughs> some of it. Some of it helped, did benefit the people. So they're in a position to renegotiate. And I think that's a tremendously wonderful model, frankly. Oh, yeah. It's very interesting to see because a lot of times 
you know, 20 years ago without the internet, we wouldn't even get as much information as we do about the way other countries are handling the situation. They would just right. put a wall up and be like, you don't even need to know that there's countries that have decided to not pay their debt. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The information that's out there is, is really important for us to understand now that we do have this tremendous amount of information and to understand that we, the people, have a great deal of power. The marketplace is a democracy if we choose to use it as such. Every time we buy something or decide not to, we're casting a vote. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's not, but we, we, it's not just about not buying. It's also, or, or, or how we buy, it's also sending a message. So, you know, for example, if you love Nike shoes, but you decide not to buy them because you know Nike's got slaves working for them in sweatshops in Indonesia, you don't buy those shoes, but you also send Nike an email saying, I love your shoes. It hurts me not to buy them, but I can't <laughs> as long as you're behaving this way. Pay those people a fair wage and I'll be your biggest supporter. Right. And then I guess the flip side, the devil's advocate argument is that, well, then you won't be able to afford the shoes because they'll be so expensive. But I don't understand what's wrong with making less than $5 billion profit. You know, can't we take it out of that and, and make well, a situation that works for everyone? Yeah. And, and, and executives who make salaries in the 20s and 30s and 40s of millions of dollars and then get bonuses on top of that. And all the amount of money that Nike spends on huge sports people who don't really need the money anyway, uh, and on, ad on advertising in general, take, take that money and, and pay the, the laborers a, a, a decent wage. And, and you know what? It was Henry Ford years and years ago who said, I want to pay my workers at Ford Motor Company enough so that every one of them can afford to buy a Ford. Mm -hmm. The world will be better off than my company will be. And, and I think that that's a very, very important statement. I, I wish Phil Knight at Nike and many other executives who wanted to single out Nike, but would take that to heart and say, hey, if I pay my workers in Indonesia enough that they can afford Nike, everybody will be better off, including Nike. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's uh, it's an excellent point about Ford because now I can walk into some of these luxury malls and you see Lacoste and Nordstrom's and these type of stores. And the people, I know people who work there, they make $9 an hour. They can't afford anything in the store that they work at. It's kind of like really backwards to think about it that way. Like, can't the company even pay their own people enough to afford their own products? Yeah. Well, Greg, and this is one of the things I, I, I speak at quite a few business conferences, surprisingly enough. I just we recently we spoke, spoke to 2,000 executives at, at a big conference and happened to be in Istanbul just because that's a conference center these days. But, and, and when I speak to these executives, I tell them, you know, th there's a new world emerging and the, and the corporations that are going to be successful are the ones that are going to su support a sustainable world and one where workers get paid just salaries one that is taking care of the environment, one that's creating a better world for our children and grandchildren. I, and, you know, I, I, I tell, I say, you know, you, you're not going to have a market out there for much longer. <laughs> you don't pay the your workers enough money that they can afford to buy decent products. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's totally true. And on the subject of voting with dollars, I mean, if, if people wanted to vote with their dollars and weren't totally educated, who would you suggest are the biggest culprits today or the robber barons, to use a term from your book? Well, I think most everybody knows these companies. If you go to dreamchange.org, a nonprofit I put together, you'll see some lists there. But, you know, that's changing all the time. Right. And for, for example, recently, we've, we've actually seen Walmart becoming greener. Now, and, and I totally applaud that. And it, it may be that um, they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. It's just for publicity. But companies are doing this. And even if they're doing it for the wrong reason, that, that's helping them understand that they still need to do it and they'll come around. So I, I think that, you know, what I, I like to look at this is that there are, there are no bad corporations out there, and that's a stretch when you come to somebody like Monsanto or mm -hmm. Texaco, which is owned by Chevron or Monsanto, you know, or or Exxon. A lot, of the, you know, it's it's a stretch. But the fact of the matter is, there are just people working for corporations, 
And some of the executives of these companies may very well be sociopaths who don't give a damn about anything except making profit. Mm -hmm. But we can bring them around. And I think rather than trying to blame corporations, what we all need to do is take a lot more responsibility. So I would encourage every listener that you have to, 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 to single out one corporation that they particularly are incensed by, Nike, Monsanto, Chevron, whoever, and or uh, just take a look at the products that you're buying and, and take a look at the companies and see how you can encourage them to be better. Mm -hmm. um, and then start a campaign. You know, who, who amongst us doesn't email at least 10 people every day or yeah. two or three? Probably most of us email a lot more. And, you know, enroll those people in helping you. Send them an email and say, hey, please send an email to XYZ Corporation and tell them you like their products, but you're not buying them until they do such and such, clean up their environmental approach or their social approach or whatever. And send this email on to 10 of your friends. And if, if each one of us did this to 10 people that we, that we Facebook with or email and ask them to do it to 10 people and ask them to do it to 10 people, we'd have a heck of a campaign. And corporations mm -hmm. have to hear this. You know, it, 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 executive officers don't read all these emails, but somebody re puts them in a matrix. So once a month, these, the CEO gets a matrix of what his customers are thinking and what they're saying. And, you know, mm -hmm. these have had a huge impact. Public opinion has a huge impact. We got rid of apartheid in South Africa back when I was in college because we boycotted corporations that were supporting it. We get corporations to clean up terribly polluted rivers in the United States and to open their doors wider to women and to minorities. And things have changed a lot in the corporate world because we, the people, the consumer, has put pressure on them. And now we need to ratchet this up a notch and say, hey, we're only going to support companies that do not buy into the tenant that the only responsibility of corporations is profit. We need to turn this around and say the responsibility of corporations is to serve the public, to create a better world, to move us out of what I call a death economy that's based on militarization and, and destroying the earth, ravaging mm -hmm. the earth, wasting resources. We need to encourage all these corporations to support a life economy, which is about cleaning up pollution, helping starving people grow food more effectively and, and distribute it, uh, creating new technologies for transportation, communications, banking, all of these things. There's a, there's a whole new economy out there waiting to happen, <laughs> but we need to push for it and make it happen. I think that's those are great ideas. I mean, a lot of change can definitely come from accepting personal responsibility. People can watch eight hours of The Bachelorette in, a, in half a year, but they can't be bothered to send an email. And yeah, that would that would definitely help the problem. But let's let's look at some of the, the root of of these issues, because you mentioned that you don't think capitalism is to blame, but rather this warped mutant form you label predatory capitalism. But I'm inclined to think that predatory the, this predatory form is actually just kind of a natural result of ultra successful capitalists. But do you think we can have one without going to the other? Well, yeah, you know, capitalism is a trigger word these days, and it's it's been, the, the the idea has been around for over four hundred years. Not mm -hmm. always the same word. If you take a little marketplace in the high Andes or the Himalayas, uh, where people just you know barter goods, that's that's a form of capitalism, and and, and it's been very successful, and it's, it can be very benign. Local markets are, which I really encourage. Uh, so maybe we just need to think of a different word. Because capitalism now has come to – a lot of people understand it as being about these huge corporations, which are doing a very, very bad job. Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily what capitalism really is. Anyway, let's not, let's not worry about the word. Let's, well, sure. I think what we need to say at this point is we need to move out of this death economy and out of this uh, concept that, that businesses are, supposed, are there only to make profit. And we need to move into a new – a philosophy that says that we're going to create a life economy, one that makes the planet a better place. Um, and this is not going to put people out of work. There's tremendous amount of work to be done to clean up the terribly polluted waters of the planet and mm -hmm. the polluted air and the polluted soil, uh, to bring back life to rainforests and, and other destroyed forests, to help you know bring, bring back li life to animals that are on the verge of extinction, um, to create new technology so that we 
a 180 pound person like me doesn't drive around in a two ton car. Uh, this, there's just so many opportunities, Greg, to, to uh, create an amazingly dynamic economy. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean that we've all got to give up our jobs or, or, or live in caves. Uh, <laughs> that, that's not going to happen. We, we just get to be creative and mm-hmm. come up with new approaches that will enhance life on this planet for all sentient beings, not just human beings. I think it's an incredibly exciting time. And we can call it by any name we, we want, greenalism or capital. Yeah. It doesn't matter. But the fact of the matter is... Um, we just need to move out of this old paradigm uh, the, uh, of the way that we've defined economic growth up until now and redefine what economic growth is all about. Hey, that is, that's totally fair. And uh, in terms of a, a great real-life example of some of these things you're talking about, I was really shocked and uh, unaware of the way corporations worked in the early days of America and the need for companies to justify their charters. It seems like an amazing system, and it's it's odd. Like It seems so foreign to me that we ever even had that. But could you give some the people some more details about how that used to be? Well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous uh, model. For the first hundred years, the United States was a country. No corporation could get a charter in any state unless it proved it was going to serve a public interest. Charters lasted on average for 10 years. There were exceptions. But for most companies, after 10 years, they had to go back and demonstrate that they had served a public interest and commit to continuing to do that to renew their charter for the next 10 years. And that all changed in the late 1800s uh, when the Supreme Court decided that corporations had the rights but not the responsibilities of individuals. And that was brought about, that change was really initiated by one man, John D. Rockefeller, who who, who went to the state of New Jersey, to, excuse me, Delaware, to begin with and said, hey, you know, don't require that I serve a public interest. Let me just squeeze the hell out of profits here <laughs> and I'll pay big taxes to the state of Delaware. And then New Jersey followed suit. And, and one after another, the states tumbled and it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court found in favor of the corporations. And that's continued. I, you know, but I think there's an amazing precedent there that we need to return to that idea that corporations exist to serve a public interest. Mm-hmm. They're there to serve the 99%, not the 1%. Yes. And we need to insist on that. And, and, and it's the 99% that actually has the power. We think, well, it's the 1% that has the power. They own the corporations. True. But the corporations don't succeed regardless of who's, who owns them if nobody buys from them. And that's where we have the power. Yeah. I. Exactly. It should be a privilege to exist for a corporation. I mean, they're, they're not people. They they weren't here first. You know, they're a product of man. And as a result, they should be subservient too. And they should uh, definitely think of it as a privilege to exist and constantly have to justify that existence. I would, I'd be happy with that world. I mean, I'd love to put more rules and regulations on these companies to force morality. But at the same time, I have concerns that it would be a never-ending battle against people like Rockefeller who just rolled back that regulation. Well, I think what we have to recognize is that we're not going to get our politicians to impose those rules as long as our politicians work for the corporations, are, are paid by the corporations, they're, they're, you know, their campaigns are funded by corporations, and if they, if they get voted out of office, they're probably going to get a job with one of these big corporations as, a, you know, as an executive or consultant or a lawyer or something. They're going to make big money off the corporations. So they are slaves to the corporations. We need to recognize that. Mm-hmm. We need to change the law and this movement to amend, to get a constitutional amendment, to get big money out of, uh, out of campaign funding. That's, that's, an, that's a great step. I, I totally support that. And we also need to recognize that we do have tremendous control over corporations by the way we shop. You know, 15 years ago, I was told by a businessman who was who who'd practically gone bankrupt trying to get into the organic food business opening markets, and he, he failed at it. And he said, "This is never going to happen because you, you need to somehow you need to be big enough to get a large supply in order to make the economics work." Well. Whole Foods came along and did it, and they've changed the world as mm-hmm. a result. And people can object to Whole Foods' policies toward its employees and so on. Nobody's perfect, but it's a great example of how one company was able 
to turn things around so that now uh, Walmart has organic foods and every major uh, store that sells food has an organic food section and it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger be to a very large degree because of Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what are, what, you know, what are complaints people have against Whole Foods? One major thing is that Whole Foods started the whole organic food business and that's an example of how we can move things forward even though it seemed like an impossibility. I, like I said, about 15 Maybe it was a few, few more years ago than that. I was told by a, a very wealthy businessman who who thought he was going to get into organic foods that he he practically gone bankrupt because he just didn't have the supply chain, he just didn't have the the scale uh, to make it to be able to compete against the, the non-organic food people. That's all changed now. Yeah, and food. Another good point on food is that a lot of these companies have been able to shield the loss and buying power of the dollar by replacing the food we used to have, the organic food that everyone thinks is expensive now with cheap corporate laboratory food that they make for way cheaper. So it seems like you get way more, but it's not, you know, you're basically putting junk into your body and right. it, it's tough because I'd love to vote with my dollar, but I've only got so many, you know, it's, you got to pick your battles these days. You got to pick your battles. And, and it's, again, it's not just the dollar, it's the message. So, you can sure. always even you can always go online. You can always go to Facebook. You can you can recruit ten of your friends, twenty of your friends, a hundred of your friends <laughs> to really launch a consumer campaign, and those work. They do work. Um, and and I mean, you know, you also do have to use your dollar in that campaign too. But the most important thing is to get the message through. Even even if you can't always shop that way, at least keep sending the message to the corporations that you expect them. To move in this direction, that, that you, you're only going to be their customer if they move in this direction. We can all do that. Absolutely. And sometimes it's choosing the lesser of two evils. I mean, uh, when I had a corporate job and I used to only get 30, 30 minutes for a lunch break, it was a choice between going somewhere inside Target or going to grab something inside Walmart. And Target has this big thing on the wall that says they donate 5% of their profits to the local community. And yes, a lot of the stuff in a Target is made by slave labor. A lot of it's GMO food. But at least 5% of the profits are going to the local community, which is better than zero if you were to have gone to Walmart. So I think just making those kind of choices at least pushes the needle in our direction. And what you want to do is let Target know and let the other store, Walmart, whatever the other store is, know yes. I'm not buying from you because you're not doing this and your competitor is. And let Target know, I'm really glad you're doing this. Do more. Yeah. And, and push them. I'm, I'm going to you right now instead of your competitor because you do this. But I'm still looking for other alternatives, and I'm thinking of bringing my own food to work and not buying from you at all because I also know that you've got people working in sweatshops. So change your policy. So we just keep pushing them and pushing them and pushing them and realize that even those corporations that are run by sociopaths who, who have it within their DNA or their chemical system or something that they, they don't give a damn about anything, they do give a damn about the success of their company. Mm -hmm. So. While you may not be able to appeal to some of the executives on, on moral or ethical grounds, you can appeal to all of them on economic grounds. I agree. And you also talk about in the book uh, the resurgence of corporate social responsibility, which is kind of like what we're talking about now. It's uh, induced by the people forcing it on the corporations. But there also seems to be a big change in uh, the marketplace in that people seem to be getting away from the large multinationals and going with a smaller startup business. Mm. And a lot of those smaller startup businesses are the ones that are saying, you know, for every shoe we sell, we plant a tree or for, you know, mm. this amount of our profits goes to a little charity we started and all of our workers are paid well. You know, those little companies are really coming around. And I, I think that, you know, if we're going to be optimistic, I think there is some potential there for them to rise up and these other old school companies to see the error of their ways. I think it's possible. Oh, totally. You know, and I, I travel all over the world in the last year or so. I've been in Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, Middle East. I travel a lot to Latin America, um, you know, all over the United States. And everywhere I go, I, I find that people are waking up. The consciousness is changing. We are in a revolution and people are understanding the importance of buying locally all over the world, and, and of buying to the, to the small producer. And you know, one classic example, and 
it is a little town in Vermont, uh, Brattleboro. Uh, and a few years ago, Walmart wanted to come into the town. The people said, no, we don't want you. But the courts said they, could, they had to let Walmart in. Hmm. <laughs> and so Walmart built this big box store, you know, in, in, in Brattleboro. And the people didn't go to it. They didn't buy from it. They continued to buy from the mom and pop stores in town, even though they may have been a little bit more expensive. And Walmart closed down. There's a big empty shell there now, at least. <laughs> well, I haven't, been, I haven't been back for three years, but I presume it's still that way. Uh, I, I think that's a great example. You know, the, the power of the dollar, the power of supporting the local community, of supporting local uh, merchants is very, very important. And the same with banks, supporting local banks. Um, we have tremendous opportunities here to really change the world. And we're in the process of doing it. We just we need to accelerate it a bit. Absolutely, man. I totally appreciate that because I've had a lot of depressing information in the last few shows and a real lack of positivity. So it's good to to highlight something as a as a course of action and a proper direction. I think that we've done that. And I think that you're you're right on with the emphasis on informing them. That's a free thing to do. You waste so much time watching just a an hour show or one basketball game. And it in that time, you could have emailed 10 cor- corporations and, and told them told them off and maybe had some influence in changing at least one person's mind up that ladder. So, you know, you know, great to, to take a negative approach, uh, to, to, to be, to get discouraged, um, is, you know, it's, it's understandable, but in a way it's the coward's way out. And it's, 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 and I don't mean to trigger anybody who's, who's <laughs> not very negative now because there's good reason for people sometimes to feel that way, but to recognize that, when we when we take that attitude, they've won. That's what they want. They want us to feel powerless. Um, you look at any revolution. Look at the American Revolution. The British did everything they could to make to, to make the the Americans feel that, that we had no hope of ever winning a revolution against them. Fortunately, not everybody fell for that. A lot of people did. A lot of people just said, well, threw up their hands and said, "Hey, there's no, there's, there's no point in fighting the most powerful empire in the world today, which was the British Empire." But Others like George Washington and a lot of farmers and hunters and so on said, hell no, we're going to fight. And, and I think we're at that situation today, too, where if people are feeling negative and they're, they're discouraged and they, 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 they want to give up, just to recognize that that means that, that they've beaten you. And, and that's exactly what they want you to do. So the better thing to do is to look at this, the great pleasure that we have now. This is the greatest revolution in history. I am so... I feel so honored. I'm so excited to be alive at this time, to be out there saying these things, to be fighting for this, to be dancing the dance of changing corporations, of changing the world. And of course we can do it, but we can't do it if we just throw up our hands and say we can't do it. Then of course we can't do it, but we absolutely can do it, and we are doing it. It's happening around the world. Things are changing big time. Amen, man. I totally agree. The game is not over, people. So, John, it has been a real honor. I have a lot of respect for your willingness to speak out and all the insight you've given millions of people into how things work behind the closed doors. It really is invaluable, and people shouldn't underestimate that. So thanks a lot. I mean, would you like to give the people your website or anything else before I cut you loose? Sure, I would. Thank you. JohnPerkins.org. Please go on and sign up for my newsletter, which only comes out once a month. Uh, and uh, you have to sign up for it on my website, johnperkins.org. Also, a, a nonprofit I created 25 or so years ago, dreamchange.org. That has a different newsletter that goes out once a month. Sign up for that one, too. And Yeah, and also you can find on there where I'm speaking. I, I travel around a lot. I'd love to meet your listeners. Uh, so please check that out at johnperkins.org. And I'm also on Facebook and Twitter, so you can, you can check that out, too. And I just want to say, Greg, that I really appreciate all you're doing and, and thank you for this show and for, for all that you're doing. This, this truly represents freedom of the press and uh, the awakening of consciousness. Oh, thanks so much. Very much appreciate that. But very cool. John, it has been an honor and privilege. Thanks for being here. Take care of yourself out there, man. Likewise. Have a great day. Hi, right, you too. Bye. Economic hitmen, predatory capitalism, and consumer power – Yes, I'd like to change the whole game. Yes, I'd like to tear down the system and build it anew. 
But the big question with something like a resource-based economy is always, how do we get there from here? It always seems so foreign to what we have that it's hard to conceive for the masses. But I think the way to get there is by making it easier for people to visualize, and we get there by nudging this machine in the right directions and using that consumer power while we still have some left. Compassion capitalism. I could live with that and die happy. Life is about compromise, I'm learning. But there we have it, people. Thanks for listening. The new Conspiracy HQ project is coming together really well, soon to be released at ConspiracyHQ.com. The Secret Space Program Conference is this weekend. Hope to see a couple of you there. Life is good. You're happy. I'm happy. Let's reject the abuse of the corporate world and value ourselves enough to command the respect we should have never lost in the first place. We got dreams to achieve. And like today's Money Bomb winner, when the universe gives you an out, you got to take it. I wish you all the best. Find your passion, take some chances, and throw off those corporate chains. I really think Afro Man said it best when he said, I quit my job this morning. I don't want to work no more. I ain't working for no $5 an hour. Yeah. McDonald's and Taco Bay. Yo, that modern day slave. Hell no. It's knocking on my front door. I don't fit in the corporate whoa, world, whoa. man. Get you a big fat sack of yeah, yo. Can't see my kids, can't see my wife. Hell yeah. Can't see a way to control my dog on love. Hey man, break it down for all these super tired oh, pencil me. I got hired at the dope spot. Dope spot. I'm an employee. Hell yeah. Get cracked like a black chef for your deep. Got meth, speed, whatever you need. Zig zags come free with a bag of weed. If you want some shirt, you gotta talk to her. Skinny black dude with the real long perm. Laptop computers, rap CDs, Motorola phones, Sony color TVs. I got the porno tapes in the back of the car. You get it free when you buy a hot VCR. Got gats and D's, car batteries. Getting bunny with my folks on them hundred spots. Hot saying waiters. We don't tip and treat no. cars like women. Take them home and strip them. Match the pink slips, get the smock inspection. Put an ad in the paper in the classified section. Cause I don't wanna work no more. Modern day slavery knocking on my front door. Can't see my kids, I can't see my wife. I can't see a way to control my own life. You must be crazy. I don't wanna work no more. Modern day slavery knocking on my front door. I can't see my kids, I can't see my wife. I can't see a way to control my damn life, motherfucker. I quit my job this morning. Get a haircut. I don't want to work no more. I can't be Afro man with a ball but head. McDonald's at Taco Bell. Modern day slave. Random drug test. It's knocking on my front door. Whoa, whoa. Drug test. Uh, get you a big fat sack of yeah, yo. Can't see my kids. Can't see my wife. Can't see a way to control my dog on love. How you gonna write me up for insubordination? I'm not being insubordinate, motherfucker. Tell the neighborhood, watch, tell the neighborhood, listen, tell the neighborhood your big screen television missing. You knew in my hood, so I gotta come to you. Steal your car battery and sell it back to you. Uh, then I come back, back just for kicks. Leave your car sitting on no big bricks. No big bricks. All I need now is some baskets, homes, cause my garage look just like auto zone. I need a beaver. What you say, man? I need a beaver. You need another beaver. I need a beaver. Buy it from me, cause it's a whole lot cheaper. But got a cellular phone, and you really ought to get it for a limited time. Brother, the chip come with it, so come to my house when your times is hard. Just like Vegas in my backyard. I keep my afro pick, my khakis crease, and my next door neighbors calling up the police. Cause I don't want to work no more. Modern day slavery knocking on my front door. I can't see my kids, I can't see my wife. I can't see a way to control my own life. I said, I don't want to work no more. Modern day slavery knocking on my front door. I can't see my kids, I can't see my wife I can't see a way to control my damn life Come on, y'all I quit my job this morning I quit, I don't want to work no more Can't believe the bullshit I went through Fuck McDonald's and Taco Bell, yo Modern day slave Is knocking on my front door Bitches at the air Get you a big fat sack of yeah, yo Can't see my kids, can't see my wife a way to control my dog yeah. don't love. Hey, all of your uniforms, they was fucked up when you gave them to me. Give me my last paycheck, bitch. Whoa. Reckless, snatch your necklace, sell it on the corner, then buy myself breakfast. I made $80 in an hour more. Hour more. Now, what the fuck, I wanna get a job for. So the yuppies, the cuppies can cross their power. Stay Pay power. my black ass $5 an hour. And the fact is, after taxes, gotta live where the 
Mexicans and the black seers, motherfucker. Crooked police, gangs, and Chuck Taylors. Well, I'm sleeping in fucking trucks and trailers. Three hundred dollars every two weeks from the suit and tie, penny pinching, pencil neck geeks. Abraham Lincoln told me I was free, so I'ma walk to the counter and do what I wanna. Why you at work? I'll be watching cable with your girl dancing naked on my new pool table. I don't wanna work no more. No. Modern day slavery knocking on my front door. No. Can't see my kids. Uh. Can't see my wife. Uh. Can't see a way to control. I'm like that. I don't wanna work no more. So Modern day slavery knocking on my front door. So I can't see my kids. I can't see my. Hey man, I gotta sell like a twenty dollar rock. Hey y'all keep singing. I'll be right back. I quit my job this morning. Hell yeah. I don't wanna work no more. I wish I could brainwash people. Like Ozzy Osbourne, Ozzy Osbourne. modern day slave, <laughs> Black Sabbath. It's like you know, hell yeah, hell yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I make everybody quit their job at the same time. And shit. <laughs> can't see my kids, can't see my wife, can't see a way to control my dog on life. Throw a big ass riot. <laughs> Damn, think about it. There's only 7,000 cops in L.A. Damn. And it's 14 million people. You know what I'm saying? Ooh, wait. Kick them motherfuckers ass. These motherfuckers <laughs> throw a ride just take everything. Just to make the corporate world collapse. <laughs> Walk all in the grocery store, grab sirloin, T-bone steak. <laughs> Eat good and go in the mall. Just <laughs> taking all kind of real new air bags. <laughs> everything. Come on, cut all this bullshit out. Revolution. Let me stop. Revolution. Boys, motherfuckers. FBI fuck around and be playing this tape. Hell yeah, and your ass That's some of bitches are communists. <laughs> yeah, like Kill that, that nigger. Uh, I come up missing this shit. Uh, man. Uh, man, you at know. the top of our news, investigators are looking into the mysterious death of Joseph Foreman, known stop. to him as Afro Man. <laughs> hey, you better quit that shit, bro. Let me stop. I know, yeah, let me stop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck that shit. I'm alive, motherfucker. You smell me? Are you bullshitting? <laughs>